Good morning on this beautiful day in Fort Worth. I'm Eric Lee, director of the Kimball Art Museum, and welcome to the <laughs> welcome to the opening symposium for our two special exhibitions, Louis Kahn, The Power of Architecture, and The Color of Light, The Treasury of Shadows, pastels by Louis Icahn from the collections of his children. The exhibitions uh, we open this weekend both celebrate the architect of the great building across the lawn, which ever since its opening in 1972 has been rightly regarded as one of the supreme achievements uh, of the modern era in architecture. Louis Kahn, The Power of Architecture, was organized by the Vitra Design Museum in Weil am Rhein, Germany, and the Netherlands Institute of Architecture, Rotterdam. I want to thank the staffs of those institutions and especially the exhibition's curators, Jochen Eisenbrand, chief curator at Vitra, and Stanislaus van Moos, an art historian and architectural theorist from the University of Zurich. The exhibition has appeared at a number of venues across the globe, but the Kimball venue is, of course, the most moving because the exhibition is seen in the galleries that Kahn designed himself. The Kimball's curator, Jennifer Castle Price, did a spectacular job organizing the show for the Kimball. She is terrific with installations, and this show is no exception. I'd like to thank Jennifer and, indeed, the entire Kimball staff for doing, as always, such a masterful job. I'm so pleased to introduce our first speaker, Win Wendy Lesser. The timing of our Khan exhibitions is especially fortuitous because it coincides with the publication of Win Wendy's excellent new biography of Khan called You Say to Brick, The Life of Louis Khan. The book has received rave reviews. It is extremely well-researched and has a, a lot of new uh, uh, information. And because Wendy is such a great writer, it is also a very good read. If you don't have a copy already, I recommend that you buy it today in, in the <laughs> Kimball shops. Wendy is the founding editor of the literary magazine, The Three Penny Review, and I also recommend that you subscribe to it as well. She launched, launched The Three Penny Review in 1980. Um, it's remarkable longevity speaks to the magazine's lively discourse. A graduate of Harvard College, she attended graduate school at Cambridge University and at UC Berkeley. Her writing about literature, dance, film, and music has appeared in various publications in America and abroad, and she is also the author of 10 nonfiction books and one novel. Wendy has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation the American Academy in Berlin, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and many other institutions. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the New York Institute of, for the Humanities. I'm delighted that Wendy will begin our program today. She will speak on the man behind the buildings. Please welcome Wendy Lesser. Thanks so much, Eric, and, and thank you all for coming today. I'm very excited and pleased to be here at, at this particular opening at this building. And I won't be showing you slides as some of the later speakers will, because everything that you need to see is right there across the lawn. The building itself and the exhibit which shows you all the marvelous phases of Louis Kahn's life. Um, I wrote a biography of Louis Kahn for very much the reason you're here today, which is his architecture is great and fascinating and an important artwork of the 20th century, not only in this country, but worldwide. So that was my initial motive, the work, which is fascinating. Um, but when, t when you set out to write a biography, you, of course, then develop more specific motives. And so I would say there are two behind the work that I did. One is what was expressed to me by an architect I spoke to early in the interview process, David Slovic, who was a student of Kahn's and an architect working under him. He lives in Philadelphia. And when I finished talking to him for a few hours about everything that had happened between him and Kahn and his work with Kahn, 
He said, you know, here's what I want to know. We all had the same education. We all had the same training. Why did he turn out to be Louis Kahn and we didn't? And I said to him, well, that's kind of what my book is setting out to explore. But when you actually start looking into a life, you get interested in things other than what fed into the artwork, what fed into the architecture. You start getting interested in the person as a human being. And that has its rationale in biographical terms as well. And I, I like to think of a quotation by one of my favorite writers, the 19th century mystery writer, Wilkie Collins. And if you haven't read The Woman in White, you have a thrill in store for you. But he was a great thriller writer, practically invented the 19th century mystery. So he was very interested in plot. But finally, he said what was important was character. And the way he put it was, the only narrative which can hope to hold a strong, uh, uh, lay a, a strong hold on the attention of readers is a narrative which interests them about men and women for the perfectly obvious reason that they are men and women themselves. And I think, of course, that's true of all of us. And when we read a book, that's what we're interested in. What kind of human being is this that we're reading about? And so I can say that the rationale is that by delving into who Louis Kahn was, I'm drawing you into the sense of what his artwork was and bringing a wider group to his, uh, to his architecture. And that is true. But it is also just interesting to find out what a human being is like. Um, so let me tell you three interesting moments in the process of the research that I did on Louis Kahn. And uh, I might read from you a little bit of what I found. And then I'll, I'll go into why that was and was not useful in talking about him as an architect. The three particular moments I'm picking out are first, one that happened in 1945. His brother, Oscar Kahn, wrote him a letter. And I knew about this letter because Nathaniel Kahn told me about it. When you're writing a biography, you depend very much on the kindness of other people to illuminate what's going on and give you their leads that they've found. And Nathaniel had found this letter, which he miraculously had not used in his movie. And so I was free to discover it myself. It's a four-page handwritten letter by Lou's younger brother, Oscar Kahn. They grew up together. They were only th uh, three years apart. They shared the same room in their entire poverty-stricken Philadelphia childhood. And then th their paths began to diverge when they were in their 20s. And by this time, Oscar was living out in California, where the rest of the family had moved. And Louis Kahn had stayed in Philadelphia. He was by then married to Esther, his wife, Esther Israeli. And he was living in her parents' house with her where he continued to live for 30 years after they were married. And Oscar was writing to him in 1945, not having seen his brother in about 15 years, and saying, what happened to you? Where have you gone? You know, we, we don't see you anymore. And it's four handwritten pages. And the first page and a half are reminiscences of the, their childhood and so forth. And then he kind of catches himself and he says, actually, that wasn't what I meant to write about. I meant to write about your curious disappearance. And then he goes on and talks about how important family is and how important life is, not just work. And he's essentially saying to Lou, when Lou is not famous yet, 1945, he's done a few nice worker housing projects that were good, but nothing to make him stand out in the world of architecture. But already there's a sense that he is focused on his work and his ambition. And Oscar is saying to him, Look to your family. Look to your beautiful child, Sue Ann, who's only five at this point, and watch her grow up into a beautiful young lady. And then he says, certainly you will build the first breathing wall, which is kind of a fascinating phrase if you look at the walls of the Kimball when you go in there, at the way that concrete comes to life. More than about 25 years before Lou ever built anything like that, his brother is saying, Certainly, you will build the first breathing wall. But then he says, even skyscrapers have their height limitations, and so do our careers. And you need to look to the personal. And someday, you will want to get a splinter of the family tree. And then he says, I hope I make sense. Much love, Oscar. So and, and Oscar wrote this in April of 1945, and he died suddenly in December of 1945, a very young man. Uh, 41 years old. 
And Lou kept this letter for the rest of his life. There it was among his papers when he died. As far as we know, he never answered it. But reading this letter, I had the sense of a, a family member's insight into this person, who he was at the time and who he would become, and some central quality of himself that was evident to his brother before he even fully became himself. The second incident, which is a very large incident, a whole psychology study, took place in 1958 at UC Berkeley. And this I got the lead from Bill Whitaker at the Architectural Archive, who you'll hear from right after me. And Bill sent me a PDF of things he had obtained through email without fully knowing what they were. He just said, this is some kind of survey or interview or whatever material that somebody accumulated somewhere. It might have been Berkeley, he says. Uh, and I don't know exactly what it is, but it's really interesting material. So you can't use that kind of thing if you're a biographer. You have to know where it comes from. It has to be sourced, and it has to be verified. So I used the biographer's essential tool, Google. I went online, and I found out, you know, I went uh, Berkeley, psychology study. And I found that in 1958, a man named Donald McKinnon had run a psychological study of architects. And he had asked everybody that he knew in the architectural world to nominate who they thought were the best architects. And then he had sifted down to 40 people. And a lot of them were big names at the time, Philip Johnson and Richard Neutra, Charles Eames, uh, various other famous architects. And Louis Kahn was among them. And at this point, 1958, he had done the Trenton Bath House, the Yale University uh, Art Museum. He, uh, he had he had done a few private houses, and he had started on the Richards Building at Penn. But really, he was not a well-known figure in any way, but within architecture, he was already well-known and extremely well thought of. And so he came out to Berkeley and had a three-day battery of tests and interviews, all of which is residing in a warehouse in Richmond, California, just down the street from Berkeley. Because I'm from Berkeley, I was able to get access to this stuff very easily. I just call up the psychology department and say, hey, can you show me that stuff in the warehouse? And we go over there, and I, I'm pawing through all of his psychology studies. Because in 1958, there was no human subjects law whereby you said you were doing something in confidence and it never could be revealed. It, it could be revealed to anybody. And so there I am looking at his Rorschach test and his Minnesota multiphasic personality test and all these other things, which of course, mostly are nonsense. And in fact, Donald McKinn was never able to publish anything significant on uh, the creativity of architects, because when you do these things in the aggregate, you don't really get anything very interesting. But there were some high points. Many of the interviews that were conducted with Lou got at personal memories he had and thoughts about his family. And so all throughout my book are quotations from those interviews. He thought he was just talking to one guy, but really he was talking to posterity so that his earliest childhood memory is in there, and his relationships with his father, his mother, and his brother and sister are in there, and how he feels about architecture, but also how he feels about things like beauty and ugliness, success and failure, all sorts of things like that. And, and then there's one test called the thematic apperception test, where you show artworks, uh, that's to dignify them, they're not really artworks, but sketches, uh, pictures that have something representational happening in them, and you ask the subject to tell you a little story in response to that. And that, for me, was the golden moment of being in that warehouse in Richmond. I got to read his responses to these pictures, and there were four or five pictures, and all the responses are interesting, but I'll just read you one, which I thought was the most interesting. It's um, the picture. It, which is not particularly well done, but is perfectly recognizable. It's kind of a sketchy, charcoal-y looking thing of a guy from a film noir movie, say. He's wearing an overcoat and maybe a hat. He's standing on what seems to be a street corner. It's an urban setting, that's all you can tell, and he's by himself, and it's all dark. The background is dark, he's dark, that's the look of the picture. So Lou says, waiting in hope she would pass again, Though he knew it would not happen, still he counted off seconds, minutes, playing the game of love and circumstance, a fairy tale of existence, unreal, though still real, because he was alive and capable of such a turn of mind. So that's all kind of from inside this man's mind. And then the, the final sentence says, 
There I was, watching him suggestively shaped by the light in a drooped pose of resignation. So not to psychoanalyze from a distance, but this is an incredible piece of thought taking place in his mind. The first thing I thought of was, what a romantic guy. He sees a guy standing on the corner, and the first thing he thinks is he's waiting for a beautiful, beloved woman to pass by. And in fact, this has a lot to do with Louis Kahn's personality. He took this psychological exam in early December of 1958. In late December of 1958, he met Harriet Pattison, Nathaniel's mother, at a party. Uh, he was waiting for a beautiful woman to walk by, and there she was. But also, that last moment where he pulls back and he's somebody else looking at the man standing and waiting at the corner. He's both the person in the picture and somebody looking at the picture from the outside. And I think that isn't, I don't want to go any farther with that, but just to say that is an insight into the way he was capable of thinking, both from his own point of view and from the point of view of somebody looking from elsewhere. The third thing that I got, which was in a way to me the most gripping, was on a piece of paper that Sue Ann Kahn handed to me amongst a lot of other stuff that she had Xerox for me from her family collection. And I don't think she had even read this piece of paper before she handed it to me because it was in tiny microscopic handwriting. It was with a lot of postcards and family letters. And what it was was a receipt for an airline flight, BOAC, remember the old British Overseas Airport, uh, Airways Corporation? A flight between Tel Aviv and London that was part of a big trip that Lou took that included Dhaka, where he was working on what may well be his masterpiece, that National Assembly Building of Bangladesh. And he took that trip in January of 1973, a little over a year before he died. And what's written in this microscopic handwriting on the back of the BOAC ticket is a dream that he had in Dhaka. So you can sort of picture the whole scene. He, he's asleep in the hotel room. He wakes up. He's had this dream. He grabs for the nearest paper, which is part of the trip he's been taking, this airline receipt. And he writes in tiny handwriting what the dream was. And the, and the dream starts with um, the burnt wood figure. Uh, I'll give you the exact wording. the burnt wood figure recognizable as one I met. Now, you cannot do dream analysis on a dead person who's been dead for 40 years. He needs to be there and responding and do dream association. But, but he did believe in psychology of that sort. He, he knew about it from Esther, who had studied psychology. And she, originally, they were going to go to Europe together. And he was going to study with Walter Gropius. And she was going to study with Anna Freud. So clearly, he knew about that from uh, Anne Ting, Alex Ting's mother, he knew about Jungian psychology. He was the kind of person who believed that dreams told you something about yourself. So he writes down the dream. I'm not going to give you all the details because it's very confusing. I have it in, in the book. But it, you can't really figure out what he means by all these phrases that just mean something to himself. Although for Lou, who was burned when he was three years old and the mark left on him for the rest of his life, the burnt wood figure recognizable that someone he met, that sounds something to do with him. Anyway, after he finishes writing the dream, then he says, last night, and it's underlined. And he has a little story about a dinner party he went to that, that evening, and all the people that were at the dinner party and what they said about his work in Dhaka. For the most part, they, they were criticizing the fact that this giant government building was being built when housing was such an important issue, and there were so many poor people. But there were other details in this dream which I had to contact Henry Wilcox, the person had, who had been on that trip with Lou, to figure out who are these people at the dinner party? What were they saying? What were the criticisms? And Henry remembered this. He has an amazing memory. And he said, uh, oh, yeah, I remember they were complaining about you know, not enough housing, all this. He said, I thought it was all nonsense. But Lou paid attention. And Lou remembered the conversation. And it had been important to him. And then the last part of his notation, again, I'll read you the exact words. He says, I wish I did not so much the determination to finish the capital. He's left out a word, of course, as we do when we're quickly making notes to himself. And so in my book, I say he probably meant, I wish I did not feel so much the determination to finish the capital. Or I wish I did not have so much the determination to finish the capital. You know, that it was bugging him so much. But I now, telling it to you, I think there may be many other things he could have meant. I wish I did not 
fear so much. I wish I did not desire so much. There could be all sorts of verbs that are left out here. And then the determination to finish the capital could have been a separate phrase, because this is all just notes to himself. And he follows it immediately with this. The dream above was like a warning. This strange, unrelated dream somehow is recognizably connected. One would not be without the other. The old thing bothers, and one afraid of one's own folly, which could lead to treachery, intended to do good for the nation. That he would talk to himself like this, I found so moving. This moment of reading this dream, I felt as if I had my finger on his cortex, you know, that, that I'd gotten so inside the man that I, that I was seeing him more clearly than I could ever see myself or anybody that I know in real life. And that, that was a very moving experience for a biographer. Now, to take a step back in the way he did when he was describing the picture of the film noirish guy, what's the point of these revelations other than my enjoyment of getting close to a character I never met? I think there are two uh, issues here. One is propriety and the other is usefulness. For a biographer, these are both issues. So propriety, th there has been a lot of discussion around the life of Louis Kahn about how much it matters that he had a personal life that was, to say the least, unconventional. And to me, first of all, a lot of the fuss seems strange. It, um, in a very nice piece in Texas architect Mark Gunderson said, societal standards change. You know, that there's not one rule about how people should behave for all time. And so when you write a book, you might want to be adapting to the possibility of all uh, views of what could make up a family. And I think that is a very good point and interesting in relation to Louis Kahn, that all the architects who want, didn't want everybody to know that he had two other children with two other women besides the child he had with his wife, they say, what does this have to do with his architecture? Well, for me, it does have something to do with his architecture, but it also has something to do with who he was as a man and, and what human beings are like. As Wilkie Collins was saying, this is part of the interest of men and women and how people are in the world, and this is why these facts about his life are interesting. I would guess if, if he could beam down to us now, he would be much more shocked at me telling you about his dream or his psychology tests than he would at anyone discussing the three families and the three children, because he acknowledged all children, all three children in his lifetime. Of course, Sue Ann, his own child that he had with Esther, but also he went places with Alex. He brought his friend Doshi, who had visited from India, to see Nathaniel and Harriet and said, this is my son. He was not hiding these other lives. So I think he would be much, in terms of the propriety issue, he would be much less shocked at having his personal romantic life revealed than he would be at having his psychology revealed. So now this gets to the issue of usefulness. If you're a biographer, you say to yourself, well, it may be invasion of the personal life or uh, not preserving somebody's privacy to tell his dreams or his psychology test to the world, but it has the value that people can understand his architecture better. Now, is that really true? I'm wondering, and I will tell you why it's questionable. I mean, I think, I think people should read about Louis Kahn and be interested in him because of his artwork, and they can become interested through the life. But whether there is a direct connection, that is something I had to explore for myself. Because an architect is not like an artist. Everybody knows about Picasso's personal life. Everybody knows about you know, all, all sorts of artists that are living wild personal lives, and that's considered fair game because the artist's dream, the artist's psychology test, feeds directly into the artwork. You can see it in the painting. You can see it in the Picasso painting, say, that's at the other end of the Kimball from the, where the show is. But with an architect, there are many steps and gaps between the finished artwork and the imagining in the architect's mind. It's a whole different process. It's not just a personal expression of feeling. One of the first steps, for instance, is the client. In this case, the Kimball Museum. I'm going to now focus on the Kimball Museum. Uh, oh, we didn't go to the next slide, which was supposed to have a Kimball Museum, but never mind. <laughs> um, I'm going to focus on it as an example of how an architect gets from inside his own mind to an actual phys physical object in the world. So the client for the Kimball Museum was Richard Brown, the first director. And like Jules Brown, who you will hear from this afternoon, 
who was the first director of the Yale Center for British Art, Richard Brown was one of Kahn's favored and beloved clients. He had about four or five of these guys who, Jonas Salk was another, um, who he thought really had contributed to the work he did in building the building, and Richard Brown was one of these. And Kahn's original plan was to have those, uh, you know, the vaults that you see, the arches, be semicircles, exact semicircles. And uh, Richard Brown saw this original design with the semicircles, and he said, he wrote Kahn a memo. And he said, the average size picture on the walls of the KAM will be about two and a half feet in one direction and three or four feet in the other. I'm worried about how a little old lady from Abilene is going to feel looking at our 15-inch Giovanni Di Paolo on a wall 15 feet vertical with a vault which, above which goes up to 30 feet. That's a very well taken uh, criticism and Kahn was completely in accord with that. He agreed, that is a problem. And he was the kind of person who cared about the little old lady from Abilene. He cared about the people that were gonna come and use his buildings. And I think this is where we get back to uh, the notion of him as a man, as a person. He, he was capable of seeing things from his own architect point of view, but also thinking that how human beings used the work mattered. That mattered a great deal to him. And in the earliest sketches of the Kimball, before we get past that semicircle, before we get into any of the details, there are people using the building in all sorts of ways. You can actually see him sketching in little people in a way that architects don't usually do. So he went through several versions of what he was going to do with that arc, but he had a, a guy working with him named Marshall Myers, who was one of his fellow architects, his employee, but who would sometimes go out and work on his own and then come back. And Marshall Myers is actually the architect who finished the Yale Center for British Art after Lou's death. <clears throat> so Marshall was reading a book and he came up with the idea of the cycloid arc. And that is the beautiful curve that makes those vaults. The, it's a curve that's created, it's been around since Galileo, it's created by, if you imagine a pencil attached to the edge of a wheel and the wheel rolls around and the pencil follows the wheel. That's the shape of the cycloid arc. So it's a very beautiful shape and it's a natural shape and it's a continuous curve. And it was a brilliant solution. If you look in the show, there's a sketch that, Mike, that Marshall Meyer did before he came up with the cycloid arc, which shows a sort of flattened arch. It's already got the reflectors, the beams that were gonna create the light coming in through the gap, but it's slightly flattened. It's not a, a natural full curve the way this is. So that was one solution they had thought of before, but this is a more beautiful one, the absolutely continuous curve of the cycloid arc. So Marshall Myers was very important to Lou's work as well, as all his architectural collaborators were. And Marshall said about Lou, he couldn't work alone, he always needed somebody to talk to, preferably one person. He could bounce his ideas off one person because he said that if, if there's only one other person talking, it's an event, but if you have more than two people talking, it's a performance. And he wa Lou wanted to have one collaborator, and in this case, at Kimball, in the working out of the design, it was Marshall Myers. And then there are, of course, all the people involved in the construction, and there is the engineering aspect, which is really important in the Kimball. And it, Lou had worked with a number of engineers over the years, and one was a very sweet guy who's still alive named Nick Janopoulos. He used him on many projects. And Nick said to me, oh yeah, he asked me, would this work, this curve like this with a space in the middle, a gap where you would put these reflectors, would it hold up? And Nick said, I don't have a clue, ask August Commandant. Commandant was the other engineer that Lou had worked with a lot and who was a very kind of irascible guy. Nick Janopoulos said to me, a lot of people only work with him once. Lou could get along with him, he worked with him more than once. Anyway, Commandant was brilliant, and, and he said, yeah, it'll work, but we have to strengthen the ceiling in a certain way at the point where it gets toward its peak, and therefore the concrete has to widen there, and the windows that you have there have to narrow. So that extremely beautiful aspect of the Kimball, which is those curved windows, it's less easy to see in this picture than in real life, so afterwards you can go over, but the way the windows narrow as they get to the top in a very subtle way, so that if you hadn't been told about it, you might not notice, that was due to the engineering advice that Commandant gave. 
And Commandant also told him a lot of other things about you know, where to put steel inside the concrete and very balancing things and very strengthening things and, and essentially in some ways took over the project. But it was all in collaboration with Lou. Commandant took over the project so much that after Lou died, Commandant wrote a book called 18 Years with Louis Kahn, in which he claimed to have done the Kimball all by himself. <laughs> and, and Lou, who was a very amusing and tolerant person, he didn't know Commandant was going to do this, of course, but he had his suspicions, because Commandant was a real grandstander. This is what he said about Commandant to somebody else when they were both still alive. Commandant is very sensitive to the nature of structures. The fact that he's an actor and a great performer is of no importance. I don't live in concrete. I don't live in steel. I just sense their potentialities. But he lives in them. He feels the strain of every member. He knows when a thing is pulling away or when it's staying at rest. He knows repose very well. He's not worried about symmetry. He's just a great balancer. He feels that the thing is out of balance without analyzing it. So I think that's a great statement about Commandant. It's a very generous statement about a collaborator, and it's also an interesting statement, once again, about the man who feels things in his body and understands things through his body, because Lewis basically translating from himself to Commandant. This is what he's like. He feels engineering. I just want to briefly mention, which I have time to do, the other kinds of collaborators that he had on, on the Kimball. There's the exterior of the building. And there he had Harriet Pattison working with him on the landscape. And she was working for George Patton. So officially, George Patton's firm did the landscape. But Harriet Pattison did essentially most of the design. And it's an essential part of the way you feel about the museum that it has that wonderful fountain and water sound effect outside, the sound effect of the gravel as you walk up to the shielding of the front by those trees so that you don't quite see the entrance as you're standing at a distance. This is very Louis Kahn, to not be able to see exactly how you're going to get in before you get there. That's true of many, many of his buildings. And Harriet aided and abetted this process by designing the landscape that she did. And then there's community and history. That is, collaborators don't cease when the building is over and the architect dies and history moves on decade after decade. Then the community takes over and they too become the collaborators in this building, maintaining it and making sure that it will continue to have its beauty and utility. And so uh, you, the citizens of Fort Worth, become collaborators in Louis Kahn's work as well. And whether a 12-story hotel should arise and block the light and become a terrible thing in the, in the view of the hotel becomes your responsibility. Just like, and, and history will judge Louis Kahn's subsequent collaborators the way history has judged the people in New York who allowed the beautiful Penn Station that was there up till 1963, the wonderful McKim, Mead, and White structure to be torn down and replaced by this terrible monstrosity that has existed since then. We're still talking about it, you know? More than 40, 50 years later, we're still complaining about those New Yorkers that allowed that to happen. And so the people that live around a Louis Kahn gem remain responsible and remain communally, collaboratively responsible for his work. So you can see through all these things that there's a lot, there's a many a step between the initial dream and the ultimate project. And therefore, why does it matter to know who Louis Kahn was to understand the buildings? Well, of course, in one way it doesn't. That is, anyone who walks into one of his buildings understands it on some level. That's what's great about them. They are meant for regular people. And uh, as you'll have noticed in Eric's introduction, there was no mention of architectural training in my background. I am not an architect, and I am not an architectural historian. I'm a person out there who uh, appreciates good art and good artworks, and Louis Kahn's attracted my attention in that way. So anybody who cares about the way things feel and look in the world, and particularly architecture, which surrounds us all the time and is part of all of our daily lives, anybody in that role can have access to his buildings and understand what's great about them. But I think there is also a special way in which knowing who he was 
helps you to put into words, maybe in your own mind, what it is his works do for us. And that, I struggled with this as I was putting together the materials for the book. And the thing that set me off on what I felt was the untangling of it was a picture that I saw on the wall of Alex Ting's house when I was visiting his daughter, Alex, and she was talking to me about her father. I, she showed me some pictures on the wall, and one of them was Lou standing there in his archery outfit holding a giant bow and arrow. He's 35 years old. We're seeing him kind of from the back, but his face is in profile, and he's about to shoot an arrow. Nathaniel told me he hates this picture because he thinks the archery outfit is so dopey. But I think, I, think he, I think the women in the audience will think he looks kind of handsome in his archery outfit. It's, he's very rooted in himself. He's very much in his body. And, and he's very strong looking. And I got a feeling looking at this picture of what this guy was like, how much he inhabited his body, how fully he sensed the world through his body. So of course that connects with the love affairs, but it also connects with many other things about the way he was. And I think it connects with how we feel about his buildings. That is, it's easiest to see in the Kimball of any building he ever did. But you can even, because the art was made to be human-sized and in to enclose you and to not make you feel dwarfed. But even if you go into one of his buildings that has a giant atrium in the center, like the Phillips Exeter Library or the National uh, assembly building of Bangladesh, or the Yale Center for British Art, which has a lovely huge atrium just as you come in. Even though that space is so large, you feel that it's protecting and acknowledging you as a human body. It's scaled in relation to you. It thinks that you are the measure of it, and, and it's making you larger by allowing you to be in it. And so to me, that was an essential part of who Louis Kahn was in, as an architect. Now, I thought I'd arrived at this idea myself, and I did. We all arrive at our own conclusions ourselves. But then I found in the documentation that Vincent Scully had got there before me. Always Vincent Scully was there before me. And it's a great gift to an architect to have a critic living throughout your life who so understands and appreciates what you were doing. And Louis Kahn and Vincent Scully started working at Yale the same year, 1947. Lou, as a, a teacher in the architecture program, you know, doing studio work with architecture students, and Vincent Scully as an architectural historian. And quite early on, he was tuned into what was great about Louis Kahn's work. And here's something he said after Lou died that pertains to that thought that I had already had myself. The other thing about Kahn that one felt right away was the vitality, the love of life that came out of him. He had a kind of physical generosity. He gave off life. He was a wrestler, you know, a very muscular person who walked on the balls of his feet. His hands were very big, fleshy, strong, and he gave off a sense of power. He looked so vital, so strange, so alive so full of life in contrast to the death of most things and people. Khan had that, and he gave it in his buildings. This was one of the greatest things about him, to make people realize that the arts, the physical arts, are physical. They are experienced in physical, empathetic ways. That's why I dislike the things that are written about Khan that are all cerebral, philosophical, sociological. He was physical. Lou had the physical per perception of form, and that is what made him a great architect. Thank you. Thank you.